sun You can hear their hearts beating loud Can't keep those California Indians down Hello everyone, you're listening to American Indian Airwaves. Today on American Indian Airwaves, a renewed effort towards seeking freedom for international political indigenous prisoner Leonard Peltier, who since 1977 wrongfully continues serving two consecutive life sentences in a federal penitentiary despite ongoing severe health issues. All that and more here on American Indian Airwaves. You can hear when the moon shines bright, the lone blue elk in the black of the night. You can hear, you can hear the whisper in the valley. Mm-hmm. And you know when come a cunny blows to the bar who drum. Today on American Indian Airwaves, I have the honor and pleasure to speak with Paulette Dote Rabadou and Mia Forletto on the renewed efforts in seeking freedom for longtime indigenous political prisoner Leonard Peltier, who continues serving two consecutive life sentences at the Coleman Federal Correctional Complex in Florida. Leonard Peltier is from the Anishinaabe and Lakota Nations and was unjustly convicted in 1977 for aiding and abetting in the deaths of two FBI agents in a June 26, 1975 shootout. The shootout happened on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in Oglala County, South Dakota and was between the FBI and members of the American Indian Movement who were there defending the Oglala community at their request. Three American Indian Movement activists were charged at the time, including Leonard Peltier. Yet the two other co-defendants, Robert Robertu and Darrell Dino Butler, were acquitted by reason of self-defense. Peltier later was extradited from Canada under questionable circumstances and was tried separately, and his trial was replete with prosecutorial misconduct, falsified testimony, fabricated evidence, and even the autopsy presented to the jury was done by a medical examiner who had never seen the bodies of the two other agents, plus more. Our guests for the hour are Paulette Dote Rabadou, who is the former co-chair of the International Leonard Peltier Defense Committee and was the National Secretary for the National Jericho Movement and is a principal member of the Free Leonard Peltier Now organization. She is also the former wife and companion of Robert Rabadou. Our other guest is Mia Ferroletto, who is the publisher of the New Observation Magazine's magazine and recently served as the authorized representative of the Oglala Sioux Nation in helping negotiate the repatriation of 131 ancestors, cultural patrimony, and other sacred items that were stolen from the original Wounded Knee Massacre of 1890. I begin today's interview with Paulette Dote Rabadou with an update on Leonard Peltier's case and his present health status. Oh, well, thank you so much for having us. Uh, I really appreciate it. Leonard is my cousin through marriage. Uh, Bob Rabadou and I uh, have worked for Leonard off and on for the last 47 years. Uh, The Rabadous at Peltier, of course, made up Northwest AIM. And Steve Rabadou, Leonard's cousin and Bob's cousin, uh, was one of the founding members of the Peltier Support Group. So we have worked for our family, and at this point in time, what we have is two lawyers, one working towards Leonard's clemency, uh, and that's Kevin Sharp, and the other lawyer is Jennifer Jones, and she is working on Leonard's medical care uh, and the attempt to get him transferred from a high-security prison to a lower level, 
uh, given his length of time and the fact that he has had no reprimands from the prison, his security is much lower. And so we're trying to get him moved to a lower facility. And Jennifer will also be working to help put together Leonard's parole hearing, which will happen sometime in 2024. In January, the BOP, the Bureau of Prisons put out when they will be meeting. Leonard is in Coleman, Florida. And so at that time, uh, Leonard and Jennifer will decide if they want to go in the winter or in the spring, summer circuit for his parole hearing. Uh, the most important thing that's happening right now is the fact that there has been a lockdown on all federal prisons. But for us, of course, it is very important when we look at Leonard. Leonard is 79. He'll be 79 this year on his birthday. And he has some major health problems. He has an AON aortic aneurysm uh, that has been growing slowly and that we need to have reviewed. And also Leonard has bad arthritis in his right shoulder, uh, well, practically down the right side of his body. His shoulder and his knee are in very bad shape, which makes it very hard for him to get around, he has to use a walker because his leg hurts so bad. So we are trying to see about getting him a medical transfer to have these different problems looked at. And Leonard is asking the Bureau of Prison to send him to, to Minnesota to the facility there, uh, which is tied to one of the famous hospitals. I can't think of the name. It just slipped by where they would be able to do a medical workup and check all these problems, including the fact that since he has not been out and about, his diabetes has come back. He had it 20 years ago, and because he was able to walk and stretch and go to the sweat lodge, he overcame it. But with all these lockdowns, with no exercise and poor food, um, he has gotten it back. And so that is another major problem of checking sugar every day for it. So these are some of the things that we're working on. And of course, when I say we, I'm talking about the Leonard Peltier Official Ad Hoc Committee, uh, which was formed earlier this year at Leonard's request. So myself, David Hill, uh, Dan Battaglia, Shalana, Don Lawson, and uh, Elijah are part of the core group right now working on that. The next person you'll hear will be Mia, and Mia is handling Leonard's artwork. So we are still in the process of raising funds for these lawyers of uh, selling Leonard's artwork, which, of course, now, with his arthritis, has made painting excruciating painful for him. But, um, you know, that's his, that's his estate. That's how he's able to, you know, maintain his ties, his, his memories of Sundance and of living on the reservation and in the cities and with uh, Bob's family. He and Bob... Um, whose father was Billy Rabidou, uh, were migrant uh, farm workers. And, you know, Leonard has said, you know, those were some of the best times picking apples in Wenatchee, Washington, where the family was all together. And so our goal is to get Leonard moved to a lower level facility, get him paroled, and hopefully he'll be able to go back to Turtle Mountain, which is his, his homeland, uh, where he has land, um, and live the rest of his life out there. You know, he has great-grandchildren now. Um, and because of the lockdown, it's very difficult for his family to see him. And his brothers and sisters are in the same age bracket as Leonard. So he's always worried that he's going to lose a family member. 
before he gets home to spend time with them. So, so that's sort of where we are. That's sort of encapsulated. Uh, we can talk about other parts of it later, but I would like Mia to give some information about what she's been doing and uh, the work around Leonard's art. Mia? Well, thank you, Paulette. Um, uh, my background is in fine arts. My um, undergraduate and graduate degrees are all in fine art, and I lived in New York City for 18 years where I organized benefit auctions at Sotheby's and Christie's, the two main auction houses in the world, and um, created Art Walk New York for the Coalition for the Homeless, which raises a million dollars annually and has been copied all over the country. Um, I've been working with Leonard's Art for the past couple of months, and just as an aside, I am the publisher of New Observations magazine, newobservations.org on the internet. And if you'd like to see issue number 135 on the Pine Ridge Reservation, um, you can read all of our most recent issues since I took over as publisher online for free. But we published 43 of Leonard's paintings. Mm -hmm. And um, just last week, I... Uh, finished appraising the 20 pieces that I have here where I am and um, about to appraise two more that came to me through Dawn Larson. If you go to, again, the Pine Ridge issue, there's an article by Joanna Malinowska, who is a wonderful sculptor teaching at Cornell University. And in 2012, she was invited uh, to exhibit in the Whitney Biennial, which is an extremely prestigious event for an artist. And as part of her exhibit, she hung one of Leonard's paintings and put a sign up with it saying, this painting is by Leonard Peltier. He deserves to be in this exhibit, but he is in prison. And she did this with the support of the Whitney Museum. Leonard and his art fall, in my opinion, into their own category because um, the, his paintings document the love for his people, but really the love for all people. And when I look at his work, I, I say to myself, you know, there's no way he's guilty because the pathway, you know, from the heart and, and the mind and the hand are intricately connected, and you would not see the softness and the gentleness and the love pour out of his brush the way you do when you see his work, the love of nature, the love of people, the love of animals. Um, so that is a big uh, part of what I would like to communicate with people but also the journey that he's taken as an artist, as a writer, as a spiritual warrior, all these years of incarceration. And since the art is here, my, and, and because of my background, my top goal for his art is to find a museum exhibition to coincide with his release so that people, uh, the public can enjoy uh, seeing his work and seeing the incredible quality of it and learn more about the man. But what New Observations is involved in doing at this time is uh, we're about to have our first lecture at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, and I will speak on the history of the magazine, which was founded in 1985 by the artist Lucio Pozzi, and a representative from the Wounded Knee issue will speak on their experience, which got them into the magazine in the first place, and a representative from the political prisoners issue as well uh, will be speaking about their own experience. So we'll probably begin with Wendell Yellowbull or Henry Redcloud for the Pine Ridge issue and um, a member of the Black Panther Party for the political prisoners issue. Um, there are a number of possibilities for that. And um, six to eight of Leonard's paintings will be on view at each of these talks. So we'll discuss Leonard's case, 
And you're listening to American Indian Airwaves. We're speaking with Paulette Dote Rabadou and Mia Foraletto, board members of the Ad Hoc Committee to Free Leonard Peltier. You're listening to American Indian Airwaves with an update on Leonard Peltier's case. And now back to the interview. One of the librarians that I spoke to about this project recently said that she had she gave a tour of incoming freshmen just a couple weeks ago and no one had heard of the American Indian Movement or of the Black Panther Party. Mm. And they were, you know, happily surprised to hear about all of the work that both groups had done over the years. And our goal is to have at least a dozen major institutions host this event. And at each stop along the way, Leonard's art will be on view as part of it. And the other thing that we are doing, or that I am doing, is organizing a new petition uh, for Leonard and his release. There are 3.6 million indigenous people in America, and to date, uh, based on the research that I've done, most petitions have capped at around 70,000 signatures, mm -hmm. and that's of mixed race. Our goal is to collect a million indigenous signatures for Leonard's release, and create a voting block. And and the plan is to do the same thing in the black community for the release of Mumia Abu Jamal. So that um, if there if we attain a million signatures from each group, um, two million voters at the same time we get the signatures will be handing out voter registration cards to those who are not currently registered to vote. And two million voters can change the course of of the popular vote in a presidential election and um, and ultimately change the minds of the electoral colleges as well. So um, that's something that I believe is absolutely essential uh, to changing the situation for indigenous people in America. Mia, let me ask you, uh, in terms of getting Leonard's uh, artwork exhibited museums have you encountered any issues of institutional censorship where museums simply refuse to exhibit his artwork or perhaps they strategically place his artwork in a place where it's least likely to be viewed um no i have not and um you know art three ages has been you know the artist is the leader <laughs> of social social change in, in life, in the world, you know, yeah. at large. So, um, I, I, you know, I, I'm i 67 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, I was through the AIDS epi epidemic in New right. York City where and act up with their silence equals death and, and the kind of politicized art mm -hmm. that was being made right. at that time, you know, and accepted into museums and rejected from museums. I mean, Leonard's yeah. art does not fall into that category. And, mm -hmm. you know, what breaks my heart the most, honestly, is the fact that for many years he's been flying under the radar. You know, young people, mm -hmm. many young people are not familiar with his name right. or his case. Right. And that has been a, a critical piece of why he is still incarcerated. You know, there there needs to be way more um, outrage co coming from, you know, voters, frankly, people who are actively engaged in their country. And um, now is the time of change. Deb Haaland is Secretary of the Interior. You know, we don't know what's going to happen in 2024. So this little window exists and needs to be taken advantage of at, at all costs. And um, I truly believe it's like a domino effect. You know, if you knock down one of those dominoes, a whole bunch of other ones will fall. There are many, you know, Black Panthers who've been in for, you know, approximately the same amount of time who are slowly coming out. And there's no reason why Leonard should not be uh, let free. Right. But, you know, there was one incident, and that was in the state of Washington, yeah. Uh, Leonard's yeah. paintings, there were two of them, were in an exhibit. Yeah. Um, in, and um, 
one of the agent's family members wrote and an FBI agent wrote to the people that had sponsored it. It was like for, um, say, Native American Month or something. I can't remember exactly when. But uh, they put enough pressure that it was Leonard's paintings were taken down. And we did file a lawsuit. Uh, there was uh, Larry Hildes was the attorney that filed a lawsuit against them uh, for removing Leonard's art. And uh, one of the results was that the judge that made the ruling said that Leonard Peltier had as much right as any other citizen to have his artwork displayed. Mm. But um, we've never made it to a major museum, and hopefully... That won't happen, but it's very clear that the FBI is aware of what's going on. And so we always have to pay attention. And when we've had art shows, uh, we had a big one for Leonard at the Chicago Indian Center. And so we notified them, and I talked with them when I went uh, with the, the, the exhibit, that they should be aware that the FBI might be coming to visit them. And they said, oh, I sure hope so. We'd like to get them in here and talk with them. <laughs> so that's Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That was very positive, but the uh, one in in Washington, the people were totally intimidated by the FBI and the uh, sister-in-law of one of the agents, and uh, you know, buckled under pressure that Leonard's paintings should not be allowed there. I'm I'm familiar with that event, Paulette, and um, since I. I have been in the contemporary art world my entire adult life. I would, you know, choose people, uh, directors and so forth, that are, you know, will not uh, cave in situations like that. But even if it did happen, what I would do is go after the F FBI through the press and exert pressure on them. I mean, recently... We know all of the dirty things or many of the dirty things that they've been involved in, such as the death of Fred Hampton or right. the harassment of Martin Luther King Jr., you know, to the extent that they deliberately tried to push him to commit suicide. So I, you know, I'm in this, I'm in this for the long term. And, you know, if, if reaching out to the media, which... You know, the media, I, I'm not sure what year the Washington event happened, but, you know, between all of the podcasts and, and the Internet and getting the word out, you know, there's a great deal available at our fingertips if we're willing to put the energy into uh, making it happen. So what I'm, I'm hearing is uh, censorship. Uh, is connected to all this, right? Whether it be, you know, the censorship of Leonard's art in certain political art has been censored in museums uh, over the decades. And me, I'm sure you could speak to that quite uh, comprehensively. And, um, and that's why I was asking the question, but also when it comes to American mass media performances is the censorship and the chronic censorship of Leonard Peltier's case and everything that's associated with Leonard's case, right? From uh, settler colonialism to state violence to the fabrication of evidence um, uh, that was used to keep him incarcerated in serving two consecutive life sentences. And I was wondering if Paulette, maybe uh, uh, since a lot of us may have forgotten some of those key uh, important details, of, of what transpired that led to Leonard's wrongful incarceration uh, in a federal penitentiary. If maybe you could walk us back to Leonard's incarceration and give us a sense of how the history relates to the present. Uh, well, I can certainly do that, but it wasn't even so much fabricated evidence. Mm. as the fact that Leonard was not allowed to put on a defense. Right. You know, at the shootout, there were four 
four young men, Leonard, Dino Butler, and Bob Robidoux, and the FBI throws in Jimmy Eagle. Hmm. And so after the shootout and the escape, um, there's a Sundance at Crow Dogs, and Leonard uh, and Dino are there at the Sundance and dance, and then uh, go their own ways, and Leonard is making his way towards Canada. Uh, Dino is captured, and Bob has Kamuk and uh, her sister and Norman and some of the other young people that were at the camp, and they're headed to Carter Camp's compound in Oklahoma. And one of the young men says, you know, there's a, a smell, and oh, look, we're, we're smoking, and Bob pulls over, and everybody runs away across the highway, and the car explodes from uh, the ammunition and everything. And one of the rifles that was in that car is what they claim was used by Leonard. Mm. But in, so Bob and Dino go on trial first, and Bob and Dino are allowed to talk about the reign of terror and the fact that since Wounded Knee to when the shootout happened, over 60 members uh, of elders and traditional people had been killed by the Goon Squad, which stands, of course, for Guardians of the Ogallala Nation. And so they're able to present this evidence and the fact that the elders go to an AIM conference in New Mexico and ask people to come. They ask these young warriors, men and women, to come and live on Pine Ridge with them. And so Bob and Dino and Leonard agree. Bob is living on Cheyenne River at that time, but he goes down and lives on Pine Ridge at the Jumping Bulls with Dino and Neelock, uh, Norman Brown, uh, Joe Stunts, and a group of Northwest AIM people. And so they're able to present all this evidence to this jury and show how, by the arrival of the FBI who come in on this land, two white guys in two cars, and jump out, and, you know, fire, and then the response, of course, is that um, the Native people respond, and they all admit that they fired towards these agents. And then uh, at some point, uh, the agents are killed, and they escape. And the jury in uh, Cedar Rapids said, not guilty. Look at this mountain of evidence it shows that these people were acting in self-defense and protecting the people at uh, the jumping bull compound and so bob and dino are found not guilty and when this happens the fbi just is furious and they do an analysis of bob and dino's trial and everything that was allowed in bob and dino's trial is denied in Leonard's trial. He's not allowed to put on anything that shows why he was there that day. You know, that Grandma and Grandpa Jumping Bull had asked him to come, that they had a garden and that they were cutting wood and taking care of the elders like requested. And so all of the evidence that was provided in Bob and Dino's trial is not allowed in Leonard's trial. And the two young men, Norman Brown and Wish Draper, both testify uh, at Leonard's trial, and the first thing that comes out of their mouth is that we were coerced to say this, that the FBI had been to Norman's, on he's a Diné, and mm. they had been to his house and had questioned him for seven or eight hours and intimidated his mother by screaming at Norman that he had to do this, that this is what he saw. Norman kept saying, no, that's not right. No, I didn't see this. Why are you saying this? And they actually said, you know, well, things will happen to your family if you don't. And he was a young man. He had never been around that type of behavior. And so he said, 
what they wanted him to say in an affidavit. But when he got up to testify, he made it very clear that the FBI had intimidated him. They had frightened his family. They had uh, made threats against his family in the same way with Wish Draper. You're listening to American Indian Airwaves. We're speaking with Paulette Dote Rabadou and Mia Farolato with an update on Leonard Peltier's case and the renewed initiative to ex- seek executive clemency and freedom for international indigenous political prisoner Leonard Peltier. You're listening to American Indian Airwaves. We're going to take a short break and we'll come back with the interview with Paulette Dote and Mia Ferroletto on Leonard Peltier. And you're listening to American Indian Airwaves with the Kicking Bird Singers singing the American Indian Movement song. And now we go back to our interview with Paulette Dote Rabadou. She's speaking on the FBI's coercion tactics for Leonard Peltier's trial. And now back to the interview. But even them acknowledging this was not enough to turn the tide of the uh, FBI's uh, punitive uh, attack on Leonard, uh, the man that talked about ballistics, he actually made a mistake. And when he was caught on it, he said, oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. That's really, you know, that's not really what happened. We really didn't find that particular bullet um, and that we couldn't match it. And so Leonard was convicted uh, to and sentenced to two life sentences. And in his statement, he said, you know, I knew that this was going to happen. He said, I could tell by the way you refuse to look at what's going on in Indian country, that Mm. these attacks by the FBI, you know, and the questions of our sovereignty and things like that. So uh, that's what happened. And in fact, the day of the shootout, Dickie Wilson, who was the tribal chairman, was in the process of signing over a quarter of the reservation, which had uranium mine, uh, uranium on it, to miners, mm. and to to give that all up. And that was one of the reasons that the FBI was there in force, is that they were expecting something to happen, some protests by the members of the Ogallala Nation against this happening, but it was quiet. Nobody knew about it. And so when Leonard's thing happened, the FBI was there in force to, you know, try and uh, capture them. And like I said, they got away that day and, uh, but were captured within a period of time. And Leonard went on to Canada where uh, he was captured later. I think it was about nine months later that uh, Leonard was captured, and they had already were ready to go to trial with Bob and Dino, and Leonard, of course, of course, fought extradition, and so it was decided that Bob and Dino would go on trial first. And once that they were acquitted, uh, people were overjoyed with the fact that now that Leonard comes home, he'll be able to be acquitted as well. But what nobody knew was that the FBI went job hunting for a new judge. There was no federal judge in South Dakota that was willing to take that trial. Mm -hmm. But Benson in North Dakota said he would take it and he would make sure 
that there was nothing said against the FBI, who were the standard of the red, white, and blue law enforcement agents. And he, in fact, uh, denied any of the requests uh, for uh, Leonard's legal team to present evidence that would have shown exactly the same thing that Bob and Dino was, that Leonard was there to defend the jumping bulls who were an elderly couple as well as their family that lived on uh, the compound. And so Leonard was convicted and given two life sentences. And then, of course, later on, the FBI again moved to have Leonard assassinated. A man named Standing Deer was in very bad physical health. And they promised him that if he helped to set up Leonard Peltier, that he would, they would make sure that his time was cut and he would be released and be able to get what he needed. But in fact, what happened was he was older than Leonard, maybe 15 years older, a different generation. And his generation, growing up in Oklahoma, was family did not say they were native because of the racism and, and colonialism that was happening there. And so while he knew he was a native person, he never knew ceremonies or anything. So in order to get close to Leonard, he went to the sweat lodge and sat in the circles with the pipe ceremonies and learned about his heritage. And he told Leonard, he said, they're setting you up. They want you. They want me to kill you, but I can't do it. So I'm just telling you this. And so Leonard was suddenly moved to Lompoc where they were expecting something to happen. And in the process once Leonard was there, he became part of another collective of Panthers and white anti-imperialists that were all up in Lompoc with him, and a plan was devised that he would escape. And uh, a young man by the name of Bobby Garcia went through sort of the same transition as Standing Deer um, in learning about the sweat lodge, and as a native person in Texas what it was like and so when Leonard went he went with him and helped him over the fence and when they were out there he made created a noise and the bushes and everything and hollering and yelling so Leonard could escape and Bobby was captured along with Rocky Duenas who had been on the outside and so even though Leonard was able to put all this forward at his trial, he was not, he was found guilty of escape and given another five year sentence for escape and two years for being a felon with a rifle. So that time was added to Leonard as well. But we were able to do a lot of good work there in Los Angeles, the Indian centers, both men and women sweat lodges and uh, those Indian centers uh, supported Leonard. And we had three defense houses and a piece of Tonamook. A young man from Massachusetts was carried the boar, the buffalo skin, and carried the skull every day uh, walking around with uh, people that were praying for Leonard and everything. So... There has been a lot out there, but, you know, white society is caught up in so many things and um, I think has a lot of guilt around Native issues and the way that they perceive it is if you don't talk about it, it'll go away. And we haven't gone away. And, you know, like uh, Mia said, we, we'll continue this until, you know, it's our time to transition and then hopefully... Uh, Leonard will be out by then, but um, all the work that was done by AIM to support the elders and everything came to fruition with that shootout. And, you know, the FBI to this day, when things are submitted for Leonard, are the first people to stand up and say, no, he can't be released. And so that, that's one of the things that 
we have to overcome is to become more powerful voice than the FBI. Also, um, I just want to add that the prosecution acknowledges that they never proved that Leonard ki killed the two FBI agents, which is why he was ultimately convicted for aiding and abetting. And um, Paulette, I have to say what I have learned through dealing with the, being a white woman myself and dealing with the white community on important issues like the return of the artifacts uh, and other things, the white community, I, don't, I haven't seen a whole lot of guilt. What I've seen is a sense of entitlement. And a big part of why I think I'm succeeding in, in these efforts is because I'm white and I can say to them, you know, look at yourselves, look what you're doing. Um, and it's causing people to step back and, and reconsider. And in my opinion, in terms of Leonard, you know, the facts have to, have to be uh, shot clearly between the eyes, you know, with anyone that we come in contact with. Um, throughout the course of trying to get him out. It is, it is just outrageous, as, as we all know, but it's, it's through being blatantly, deliberately honest uh, about the facts that will ultimately turn the key, in my, in my opinion, because America, as you both know, has a, a really elevated sense of itself, you know, the image that we send out all over the world is is very particular and and not true so we need to get down to what is true what our real history is and acknowledge it and make it better well, we do have some international support as you know we have a wonderful german uh, support group that um, comes over every year for the um, annual commemorative committee that happens on the Jumping Bull Ranch. And so uh, Dr. Michael Koch and his wife and family have organized in Germany. We have a large Native American uh, support group in uh, France as well. And Julia Wright and Franz Fanon's daughter, both uh, whose fathers were these eloquent writers, um, have spoken internationally at events in support of Leonard. So it's really trying to make America wake up uh, to the fact that other people understand this and that they do have to recognize the history and understand it and see where it's gone and that uh, the, change is, the change is coming. They just whether it can be with us or against us, as Ma would have said. I think, too, when we talk about the United States and and whiteness maybe as the foundation, but also the understanding that non-white people can be assimilated into those settler colonial ideologies and actually reaffirm right um, settler colonial violence and and so uh, with that, that means everybody needs to be informed right of the past and how it relates right. to the present and also building larger coalition movements, uh, such as the case for seeking uh, freedom for Leonard Peltier. So for example, you know, um, uh, and I'm just as a qu open question, I don't know the answer to it, you know, with the call for the abolition movement, you know, um, and the various organizations that emerged um, uh, out of the abolition movement, you know, what was the position with uh, seeking freedom for Leonard Peltier or taking a recent or more recent organization like Black Lives Matter that called for, you know, defunding the police as a way to eliminate the political power of the police unions and create a new system of civic patrol that isn't rooted in settler colonial violence. Uh, you know, where was Leonard Peltier as part of that conversation? Well, all those organizations need to be educated as well. Mm. And what we found is when we go and talk to them, that they are open to understanding what's going on and to understanding the role of the political prisoner. I mean, 
when you say you have political prisoners and prisoners of war in the United States, people go, but we're a democracy. How could we have this? And so the whole question of the development of like the COINTELPRO mm -hmm. attack against the Panthers, against Dame, against the Brown Berets, against the white anti-imperialists, needs to be exposed. And you're listening to American Indian Airwaves. We're speaking with Paulette Dote Rabadou and Mia Foraletto, board members of the Ad Hoc Committee to Free Leonard Peltier. You're listening to American Indian Airwaves with an update on Leonard Peltier's case. And now back to the interview. And through that, we've actually made inroads into many of those movements. Amnesty International, while it was a struggle early on that Bob took on to struggle with them, because they did not understand the whole question of armed struggle and what it meant to be a sovereign people and to defend elders on your own land, now recognize Leonard as a prisoner of conscience and have had many campaigns uh, with various presidents to help raise awareness of Leonard. And so basically it's education that needs to take place. And people need to understand their history. Uh, Peter Matheson's book in the Spirit of Crazy Horse is like the Bible of Leonard's case. It's the story of Leonard's family, of the Rabadus, the Peltiers, the Butlers, all of these Native people that were forced into relocation and what that meant, you know, the whole question of what does it mean to be an Anishinaabe and not know your language. Bob loved learning his language. To him, it was the most important thing that he could do because growing up, nobody spoke it anymore. And so all of these things happening, all these nations now that have classes where their own people learn their language. Mm. Uh, I mean, the Cherokee is one that really has struggled to teach and has made great strides in bringing back their language. And I know up on Turtle Mountain, there's classes for, for adults who never had the chance to learn their language, to learn and speak it. So all of these things in Indian country that are happening and the resistance against this settler colonialism, and it's actually a fascist state that is going to happen if we do not do something and are not able to educate enough people as to what's going on. So I think all these forces at a point have to come together. And they'll come together through education, Native people in their own ways and being brought back into ceremonies, people that have had to be forced to relocate, have their grandkids that are now going back to the reservations to learn and live and you know, go to sweat lodges and your weepies and to do all of these things that were denied because they lived in the city. Um, I think it has to, it will be a totality of all of this coming together to get Leonard out and to, you know, maintain some type of humanity here in the United States. And I think it, what I'm hearing from you also, Paulette, is that for Americans, right, this is uh, their government that represents them. And if their government has this legacy of settler colonial violence, then Americans have the obligation to address that settler colonial violence, and including... Definitely. It, Without it, a doubt. That is so true, Larry. Yes, exactly. Yeah. People have to say, you know, I mean... The first time I went to a sweat lodge was with Long Walker, Ernie Peters. Mm. And he said in the lodge, he said, now, many of you that will be doing Skyhorse Mohawk work mm. need to understand that we held no grudge against you. We do not, we are not against you. But once you have had this experience, then we expect you to stand up and deal with your own people around these issues. And that is a way for us to come together and work as one, is if you take on this responsibility once you've been allowed to enter this spiritual area 
of, of Indian country, then, then you have a responsibility. But we can't say you have to go back because what did we do in the past? But we have the future. Right. And the future has to be built with you understanding that you have a responsibility now to fight this white supremacy, to, to end colonial violence against indigenous people, uh, to stand up against all this um, pipelines and the murder of, of indigenous women. And that's your responsibility. And you need to take it to your community and deal with it. And so... Yes, yes. If we don't, if Americans, white Americans, all Americans, really, who have not understood what colonial settlerism is, then they need to be educated and we need to make these changes to respect the idea of a black nation, the Republic of New Africa, on this territory. And to understand that the indigenous people came from from Mexico, which was not Mexico at then, but that uh, all those wonderful people that you read about in history that were indigenous need to be understood what they were saying and to to take that into your heart, but mainly take it into your practice so that when somebody says something, you have the courage to stand up and say, that's racist, that's wrong ideology, you need to look at yourself and not at somebody else for what's going on. So so I totally agree with you. Yes, we have to take that responsibility to make those changes. And, and in taking that responsibility as uh, we start to wrap up our time together, what kind of changes uh, or what kind of work is being done to not only help Leonard uh, get the medical care that he needs, but also in procuring or seeking his clemency. And I was wondering for our listeners, um, if you could share uh, how people can help and what Leonard wants people to do. Well, one of the things that we're asking people right now is to call the Bureau of Prisons. And if you go on Leonard's website, freeleonardpeltiernow.org, there is information to call the head of the Bureau of Prisons and demand that they end these lockdowns. Uh, that is the, one of the main things that is of most importance because there are so many elderly prisoners who are being who are losing their lives because this lockdown, no medical care. So that's one of the things that we're asking. Uh, there's also a way to write to the president and express your support for Leonard and request that he give Leonard clemency and allow him to go home. Uh, check on uh, Free Leonard Peltier now. Get involved. There's all kind of activities there that people can do. You can have meetings. There are films out about Leonard. Uh, there's Warrior by Susie Bear. There's the incident at Ogallala that you can have speakers for. There's information on there that they can write us. And if they want a speaker, um, that we can provide somebody in their area or somebody from the committee is willing to speak. I've spoken in the Basque country with Angela Davis, and Angela has often spoken overseas about Leonard and other political prisoners and so she is part of this abolitionist movement and if we want to abolish prisons then we ourselves need to figure out how we deal with each other as human beings so that these things don't happen but on the website there's all types of information and so it's again free Leonard Peltier now dot org get involved. And people can get a hold of me. I'm living in Gainesville, Florida now. You can reach me at paulette at freeleonardpeltiernow.org. And my phone number is 218-790-7667. And I am more than willing to answer questions, to provide speakers, to have you meet other members of Leonard's committee. And you can always send Leonard uh, money 
through commissary, and that information on, is on the website as well. So thank you so much, Larry, for having us. I really appreciate this. And as Mia said, you know, uh, it's something we all have to come together to do. Mia? Thank you, Paula. I would like to put out to all of you or all of your listeners who are um, indigenous and are interested in signing the petition, even if you've signed other petitions, this is the first time that it will be a petition of only indigenous signatures. We'll have a separate petition for the black community and a separate petition for everyone else. Um, I, I am constantly reminded of the fact during the last presidential election, indigenous people had to check the box marked other <laughs> on their form. Indigenous people are not others. They are the original. And if you'd like to get involved in that way uh, and help out with the petition, please get in touch with me. Um, it's Mia, M-I-A dot Ferroletto, F is in Frank, E-R-O-L-E-T-O at gmail.com. And if you have a suggestion in terms of an art venue for Leonard's Art, please let me know. And if you are a, a, a professor or instructor at a university and are interested in having um, an indigenous and black member of the political prisoners group at your place of higher education, please get in touch for that as well. And my phone number is 802-952-6217. Thank you so much, Larry. This has been great. The moment of silence is over. And that was Paulette Dote Rabadou and Mia Ferraletto speaking on Leonard Peltier providing an update in a renewed initiative to seek executive clemency and the freedom for longtime international political indigenous prisoner Leonard Peltier. And that concludes our show for today here on American Indian Airwaves. A special thank you to our guests, Paulette Dote Rabadou and Mia Ferraletto. A special thank you to our musical guests, Aragon Star, Koopa Aina, Kicking Bird Singers, and the band Blackfire. American Indian Airwaves is mixed and mastered in the studios of Burnt Swamp Studios in Signal Hill, California. For Marcus Lopez, I've been your host for the hour, Larry Smith. Until next time. is over. Why your freedom manifests on their graves And the blood never comes clean from the guilty minds Nor the hands that hold the chains Thread